This is my third time in Korea, and I thank you very much for the honor you have given me to allow me to talk to you about my dream of the future, in which I think Korea can play a very important role. So part of the future that is so important, what was amazing to me in the first two times I came to Korea was how Korea has spent 40 or 50 years ago was one of the poorest countries in the world. And I just came from Bangladesh. Now Korea is one of the leading countries in the world with its growth. How does Korea's experience apply to the rest of the world, both to the advanced countries like the United States and the continent of Europe, and to the poor countries? In my belief, I have spent the last 40 years working primarily with small poor farmers in developing countries. And I am convinced that the leadership of the future will be to those people who understand how to move quickly and productively from poverty to prosperity. But I think the next 30 years will belong to those who do so in a way that is in balance with the uh, environment of the planet. Uh, so what I will talk about today in the next 30 minutes is what I think is needed for the next 30 years. The minister asked me while we were having coffee what I thought about how Korea and the United States relate now. My response is that that will be much less important than what will be the situation in 30 years. And the decisions you make now will determine that. So what I will talk about today is transformation. And in my view, some of the major transformations in the last 50 years have come from creating whole new markets that nobody could anticipate. So how does the kind of transformation that happened when the digital revolution came about. Korea has played a very important role in that, but a major part of that was the introduction of personal computers. And I will talk about how, as I see it, there are two main factors that have been central in each of the transformative global businesses. And that is a transformation and a revolution in cost, and a transformation in miniaturization. I will talk about that illustrated in the case of personal computers, uh, motor cars, and I think we are now, as, a, as planet Earth, at a point of reaching the limits of centralization. The future will belong to dispersal, radical dispersal, radical miniaturization, and radical affordability, much as it has in the past, but in a different situation. And rather than continued rapid growth in agriculture, the issue will be how we can take advantage of things like the waste streams that come about from industry related to agriculture and turn it into gold, and how we can the develop leadership in energy, which is a lifeblood of agriculture and many other things, but it is no longer taking advantage of the economy of scale of large central energy production, but developing the new breakthroughs and transformations at the village and pulling together all of those things at the village and creating whole new global enterprises. I, my belief, and I'm, 
we'll see in 30 years. I will probably not be here then. But we will see then who will lead and how the leadership will be expressed and whether it is in balance with the planet or not. So let me now go into some specific examples. I will show two brief videos which illustrate what I'm talking about. And then I will be very interested in interacting with those of you who are interested about how we can work together to make this happen. So I've had the distinct advantage of working with a group of designers from an aerospace company, Ball Aerospace, and they are my design team. And uh, one of them uh, put it very clearly, uh, the same systems design used to modify the Hubble it can be used to design transformative tools for the village. And they have been very uh, useful and amazing in creating some of these changes. The picture uh, to my left is the very early way of transforming biomass into coal in one hour instead of 300 million years and making a coal which mimics nature in carbon emissions in uh, uh, rather than coal. I believe coal will be, play a major role for at least 40 years and there is a huge new market opportunity in replacing coal with a substance derived from agricultural waste and invasive species but done, uh, created at village levels to lower the cost of transport. All right. The world needs now is a revolution in big business that serves a common good instead of just bottom line profits and that transforms the lives of uh, 2.7 billion bypass customers in the world who live on less than two dollars a day. First, you have to talk to the people who have the problem, listen to what they have to say. That is the most important thing, and listening is not just listening uh, with your ears, it's listening with your soul. So this is the first big picture issue. I think we need a new generation of transformative multinational companies where shareholder returns, while a very important uh, measure of success, is only one. And the future multinational corporation will need to address uh, stakeholder benefits, environment, uh, and poverty, because I think the biggest influence in de destabilizing the, the, the planet are the more than two billion people who live on less than two dollars a day, whose lives uh, inevitably influence population growth, environmental degradation, conflict, and all of the other key things that are destabilizing the planet. And uh, I think the future multinational corporation will need to address these things not because of morality, but as a matter of economic survival. Many uh, corporations are doing this already. But if you can take the lead in doing uh, these things and integrating shareholder return with all the other things, 
then that will be a major determinant of your leadership role uh, in the future. This gentleman with the 55-gallon drum, which, which leaked, uh, it is producing off-gases. Um, it's an early experiment in creating um, simple village-based uh, plants. Each plant can, uh, will have the capacity to produce seven tons of coal a day, or 300 days. We plan to implement 100,000 of these plants. And the key advantage, which has not been fully recognized, is that it shortens the collection radius from 200 kilometers to four kilometers. That lowers the ultimate uh, cost of materials produced by 40%, and more than overcomes the economies of scale uh, of a bigger centralized plant. So uh, in, in the early stage, the biomass, which, go, which is used to create the coal, is large, bulky, and the cost of transporting it is critical. If you can shorten the collection radius and do a, a simple system that is productive at the village level in 100,000 villages and then a million villages, I believe that we will be able to lower global carbon emissions by 20%. And that could be the basis of a new, like a General Electric or a Samsung with its roots in the village. That's what I think is the dream of the future. So this is Krishna Bahamur Tata. I described him and his family in my first book, Growing Cucumbers. This is the first step towards mechanization of the small farm process. And it illustrates these are the people planting rice. And as I mentioned already, the key components of major global business transformations in the past have been revolutions in affordability and miniaturization. I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Here, at the time that the motor car and the assembly line was introduced by Henry Ford, the Cadillac LaSalle represented the cars that were available then. They were small uh, in number. They weighed, the Cadillac LaSalle weighed 37.70 pounds, cost 26.85, which was quite a bit in those days. When the Ford Model T was introduced, the weight was much less than half, and the price was radically cheaper. And that led to every family having a motor car and created a global company and the whole automotive industry, which then got into trouble. At the time that the personal computer was introduced, uh, not only by Jobs and uh, Wozniak, but others, Typical computers filled half a room, were only available in universities, and cost, oh, $500,000 and up. The Apple II, introduced in 1977, weighed 34 pounds, and cost 1298 You can get the same thing now with much more power, much cheaper. But that simple revolution changed information, which you are now a global leader. Here are some of the key features of global business. You know all this, so I don't have to dwell on it. But packaging, marketing, and transfer of knowledge. But that has much broader application than uh, to simply shareholder uh, returns. So now what I want to do is examine with you what I consider to be some of the next breakthroughs in miniaturization and affordability. And they come from the maturation of agriculture, the maturation of industry, 
and the realization that the next huge market, which is basically unmet, starts with people who live on less than two dollars a day, but is applicable to the whole global marketplace. So as I mentioned before, I'll talk about three examples. If you start thinking in this way, you can come up with many more. Agricultural waste streams are an inevitable byproduct of, uh, of uh, large agriculture. Energy is the lifeblood of agriculture and is the lifeblood of many things in the world. And dispersion, dispersed energy production is a, is a major trend in the future. And finally, how do we replace coal? I, uh, some of the radical environmentalists say we must eliminate coal. I don't think that's feasible. But I think it is possible now to create a replacement for coal made from selected, a large volume biomass, which happens to be dispersed, and uh, which mimics nature instead of creating uh, a major change in carbon emissions. Here's one example. Agriculture has gone from, uh, I understand your main crop is, is rice, uh, there are other uh, grain crops. Now uh, it, the economic value has shifted to high value crops like coffee. And I was startled to learn that Seoul has more coffee shops than New York City. Well, how does this apply to waste streams? What happens to the coffee grounds after the coffee is made? In most places, it is thrown out. There have been, in the last 10 years, experiments indicating that it is a very useful component uh, in uh, fertilizer and uh, making, uh, making uh, waste, turning waste into productive use. But one really interesting potential application is that it makes an excellent input stock for mushrooms. Mushrooms are a very high value crop. Uh, a 500 square foot, maybe a, uh, an 80 square meter plot of mushrooms with intensive knowledge and intensive uh, skill can generate $30,000 in mushrooms a year. And lest you think I'm just dreaming. And by the way, uh, those coffee makers who use paper filters, that is also an, an important food. So the key food for high value mushrooms is, can be uh, derived from coffee grounds and straw and energy. The growth in coffee shops is phenomenal in Korea, from 12,400 in 2011 to close to 50,000 in 2015. I don't know what it is now. Here are a couple of students who heard a professor at Berkeley talk about this. So they started to make mushrooms out of coffee grounds and other things. They now have a very profitable business that is all over the world. But here is a mushroom business, and I was amazed to learn that this mushroom business in Korea harvests 45 tons a day of mushrooms. Are they using waste? I don't think so. They're using modern methods. The tonnage of waste just been sold from coffee shops. These students at Berkeley have become the main waste collectors from all of the coffee shops and they use a good deal of the waste themselves. Uh, I think in the future if you can take coffee grounds, which is a product that people will pay you to get rid of after the coffee has been made, and some substitute, low-cost substitute for straw, now you have to sterilize all of that or the uh, mushrooms will be invaded by mold. That requires heat. You have to basically bake the substance. If you can get the heat 
from a substitute for coal, you will have all the inputs at a very low cost, and you can make very high cost, globally sold uh, product. This is an example of the opportunities. It is not what you think of normally, but I think it means taking advantage of what people throw away in volume and doing it uh, dispersed, but then selling it globally. That's example one. The current thinking, as I understand it, about renewable energy is that it will take over much of the energy that is not renewable now. It will consist of 60% or so, that's what all experts predict, by 2040, uh, 2040. But what about coal? You can't just stop coal, although a lot of the coal companies have uh, entered bankruptcy, but it is not chapter 7, it's chapter 11. They will be around. Perhaps they can also invest in the process which we have now successfully made four samples from a species called mesquite. It's an invasive forestry species. Uh, India has been planting it on the edge of deserts for 100 years. There are 56 million acres of it growing wild just in Texas. What happens if we take what is considered an invasive species about a hundred hectare plantation in every village will supply indefinitely uh, uh, seven times a day for 300 days of that village, which will bring something like the equivalent of $700 a day in gross value. And just do the math, seven times 300, and if you can do 100,000 of them and do it primarily as a global business, I think that has the potential of becoming a major transformative global company. If this is of interest to Korea, uh, I think uh, there are many places where this could, this could become a huge impact. All right, one of the two key anticipated contributors of renewable energy is solar. But solar has gone to large solar installations. Uh, what about all of the desperate demand and need, unmet need, in villages? I don't know what percentage of Korea is electrified now, but if you take North Bihar with about 90 million people, some 77% don't have access to electricity, and one of the key commercial needs is to pump water, and they're using diesel. So, at the present time, there are 26 million diesel and electric pumps in India. They consume one-fifth of that country's electricity. Could you replace those with solar? Yes, but the cost is prohibitive. So I challenge that group of now 100 space expert volunteers to design a total system, not a solar system, but a solar system, an irrigation system, and a farming system that would cut the cost of conventional solar-based pumping to one-fifth, which they did and we've now tested it successfully in, uh, in uh, Bihar and in Gujarat. This is what it looks like. And here are the economic results of the first 11 test plots run for about eight months. Uh, already, without much preparation, it is better than a 60% return on average on total unsubsidized purchase price for the system, including drip irrigation, solar panels, uh, motor, and the whole, the whole system. I believe that it should not be difficult to make that payback within a year. And the volume potential for this is huge. The average profit at one acre system, including drip irrigation, the irrigation system and everything, retailed at about $1,200. The average net return in six months was about $1,100. And uh, the top 
uh, a producer earned something like $2,000. I'll close by pointing out that I believe climate change is the biggest challenge the planet faces. Again, with the experience of Korea and other countries with uh, intensive farming, there is an opportunity now to, within 10 years, replace 20% of global carbon emissions and replace the process of making coal. Coal comes, as you all know, from taking animals and plants, compressing them. It's a 300 million year process. And coal represents some more than 40% of global carbon emissions. We have now been able to take select invasive species, like mesquite, heat them using their own off-gases. This is a, a net plus thermal activity because when uh, a biomass reaches about 200 degrees centigrade, it begins to off-gas. You can trap those off-gases, use them as a source of thermal energy and produce a replacement for coal, which, if burned efficiently, mimics nature's process. Nature pulls carbon from the air to make a tree. The tree lives, dies, falls over, and releases it again. It's much more complicated than that. But if you could mimic that process and replace a 300 million year process with a process that takes one hour, it could have transformative impact on the planet and be highly profitable. This is a picture that got me, I got it off the net, uh, the, uh, representing the future of uh, uh, climate change. This is the process of reducing selected biomass. It doesn't work for all biomass. We tried rice straw, that's probably problematic. But you lower the mass by producing off gases which you burn. The mass goes down 30%, the energy goes down 10%. So you have an energy denser product, which is also hydrophobic. It's way below, you get the charcoal. Charcoal is very bad for the most part for the planet. But I get the office. Uh, don't know if we can turn this back. Can we turn this back? This is the last video, and uh, that will be the finish of my presentation, but I hope we will be able to engage in some discussion during today and later about not only these three opportunities, these are just examples. I think these are the future. Is it back to the beginning? I'm CEO and founder of Transform Energy, a company that will transform climate change and help 100 million poor people move out of poverty at the same time. Climate change has fast become the world's biggest challenge. And coal is the biggest contributor to climate change. It is responsible for 45% of global electricity and more than 40% of the carbon emissions that cause climate change. Nature takes 300 million years to produce coal. A talented group of volunteers at Ball Aerospace have done it in one hour using a simple process called torrefaction, which is exactly the same as roasting coffee. Here's a little lump of coal. Oh, wait a minute. It's torrified mesquite. Mesquite is found all over the world in dry wastelands and dumpings. It mimics nature's carbon cycle and burn instead of contributing to global warming. We're not going to produce this stuff in giant central plants. We're creating it in 100,000 village kilns, each producing seven tons of coal substitute a day for 300 days to replace coal with a low climate change scalable substitute. It's about time to transform climate change and poverty together at the village level. So I'll close by saying all it takes is one person with a dream. And I would welcome your thoughts about how this 
both how you think this can be moved forward, but with your wealth of experience, what are the flaws and challenges in this approach that I've missed? Thank you very much.